you might, if you were paying attention to what you were singing, and prayerfully you were, uh, you might have some indication of the message tonight uh, tied in. Uh, if you're even being more perceptive than just the, the songs about the, the blood, you'd say, hmm, we talked about the blood a little bit this morning, and it shouldn't surprise you this last Lord's Day before the Lord's table, the Lord's Supper, that uh, God himself would, would direct some preaching and teaching on that particular subject. So in uh, one regard, the message tonight kind of picks up the theme from this morning, and there might even be some uh, similar scriptures. In another respect, the message continues from the midweek service, the midweek uh, message, where we were in Deuteronomy, a little bit of 31, and, and largely chapter 32, a song of witness against Israel. And we took a little deviation, uh, chased a, a rabbit just for a little bit. It wasn't per- pertinent, necess- it's all it's all scripture that's given by the inspiration of God and is profitable. I understand that. Uh, we chased it just a little bit Wednesday, and then the Lord directed we would come back because it's more applicable today for this coming uh, Lord's table. And so in Deuteronomy 31 and verse 30, Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song. And then the beginning of chapter 32 starts the song, and in verse 40, 40, uh, 14, of Deuteronomy 32, we have uh, this part of the Lord's witness to Israel where he said, Thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape. And so again, Wednesday, we looked at this, we called it a rock song because it is about the rock of our salvation and the Lord refers to himself as the rock several times in in that particular uh, song. And yet it was a song of witness uh, against the nation of Israel. The context was the change of command again from Moses being told he wasn't going to lead Israel into the promised land and so he was going to turn the reins over to Joshua. Uh, the Lord told Moses that Israel would go a whoring after other gods after the so-called change of command. They crossed the river Jordan and would go into Canaan and, and start fighting and uh, the Lord prophesized to Moses and and to Joshua what was going to happen. And so the Lord then instructed Moses to write a song of witness against Israel. And that's specified, among other places, in verse 19 of the preceding chapter, 31. Now, therefore, write ye this song for you and, and teach it the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. And the song indeed witnessed back then and continues to this day to witness against the children of of Israel. Uh, We looked at verse 15 where uh, God refers to Israel as Jeshurun. In the next chapter 33, the last four or five verses or so uh, specifies that for us, that this is speaking of, of Israel. But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat. Thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he, speaking of Jeshurun, speaking of Israel, forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. And the more we got into that witness against Israel, the more you just kind of you can't help but kind of get a, I don't know what that look would be on your face, but you're not smiling because it's a, a, such a truthful witness of their idolatry and turning from the Lord. But the song also witnessed and continues to this day because it's the word is perfectly preserved for us. It uh, continues to witness of the Lord, the rock. Verse 3 and 4 of this uh, song in chapter 32, Because I will publish the name of the Lord... Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, a God of truth. And without iniquity, just and right is he. And then jump down to verse 12 as we continue this uh, testimony. uh, Really a witness of God's goodness to the nation of, of Israel. So the Lord alone did lead him. And the hymn there, again, is referring to, uh, to Israel, to Jeshurun. Uh, the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. He made him ride on the high places of the earth, that he might eat the increase of the fields. 
And he made him to suck honey out of the rock. That's just an interesting picture there. And uh, oil out of the flinty rock. There too, you might just be kind of <laughs> thinking that's kind of weird, but that's amazing and that's wonderful considering where they were and what the Lord was doing for them. Uh, butter of kine and milk of sheep with fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan and goats with the fat of kidneys of wheat. And thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape. And I really wanted to just make that the rest of the message Wednesday night. And God say no, said, no, stay on track with this song, uh, this rock song. And so uh, the Lord gave permission and very clearly directed to come back to this portion of scripture at least to start off the, the message tonight and to connect the pure blood of the grape uh, to the Lord's uh, table. And here's a, a simple three-part outline. Remission, redemption, and remembrance. And if you're taking notes, you can just write down those three words. I'll give you a little bit longer title for each point. Remission, redemption, and remembrance. Remission through the proffered blood of the Son redemption through the precious blood of the lamb, and then remembrance through the pure blood of the grape. And it was pure blood that remitted our sins and purchased our redemption, and it's only the pure blood of the grape that is to be used for remembrance. And we are not as other uh, churches that would use uh, the putrefying um, not pure blood of the grape, but alcoholic beverage to partake of the Lord's table. And uh, I'd like to uh, dare say this church will never use anything but the pure blood of the grape uh, when we partake of, of the Lord's table. And as uh, our song leader uh, mentioned, the, the blood is taken out of, other than the King James, pretty much every other uh, English language uh, Bible today, you'd say, well, where is that? Well, for example, Colossians 1 and verse 14, which should read and does read and prayerfully reads, again, if, if you're holding a King James Bible, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And if uh, you have some Bible other than the King James, the words through his blood either are not there and that should alarm you and concern you, or they're there, and if you would follow perhaps a little footnote, you would be uh, led to read something along the lines of, uh, these words are not in the oldest and best manuscripts. And that would be uh, Satan just saying, yea, hath God said, uh, trying to uh, get you to doubt the word of God and, and the teaching in the word of God about the, the blood. It would be referring to two specific manuscripts, not to dive backwards into our Friday night teaching on bibliology, it would be referring to Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, and books have been written why those are not uh, the oldest nor the best manuscripts. Um, thousands upon thousands of manuscripts have the blood there, and we are, have redemption through his, his blood. And I would dare say again, that uh, this church will always use the King James Bible. And hopefully, if you're not shouting it on the outside, you're silently confirming that on the inside and saying, and if not, we will not be sitting here. And amen to that. Well, let's look at the blood, remission, redemption, and remembrance. Remission through the proffered blood of the Son and we were in the Gospel of Mark this morning. A parallel passage in Matthew would be Matthew chapter 26. If you would turn there, Matthew 26 and verse 26, reading down to verse 29, these words, words should sound familiar. And I think there's a reason for that, why God has a theme for the day that would point us towards Tuesday night. Matthew 26 and verse 26, reading for a few verses. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and, and break it. And in part, uh, Pastor Sargent this morning in the preaching covered both uh, elements of the Lord's table. Uh, the focus tonight is going to be on, on the blood. I don't mean to diminish the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ nor all the teaching in John chapter 6, uh, which would be the, 
bread of life chapter, if you want to name it so, where he said, I am the bread of life, and he referenced back the, the manna that came down from, from heaven, and he was saying, I, I am that bread of life that came down uh, from heaven. So we're not going to focus on uh, the bread uh, this evening, although I did find it interesting as I was uh, just meditating on this, that Jesus, ad, as, as the bread of life, uh, took bread, and before he broke it, it, it said he, he blessed it. And this is just not part of the message, just a seed thought for you to maybe meditate on and take it where you want in your own studies, your own meditations, just the thought of before he was broken, he was, he was blessed. Um, but now we'll continue on. And he gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, uh, more of our focus tonight, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And prayerfully, if you were here this morning, and uh, well, prayerfully, if you were, you were listening to the message, and just that thought brings this sense of hope and forward-looking of when that might be, and just brings a smile to your, to your soul. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. That's from the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 9 and verse 22. And if, if you're looking for some scriptures just to meditate on uh, the next couple days, Monday and, and Tuesday in particular, you might consider reading through uh, certainly the end of the Gospels, uh, the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but then I would encourage you to perhaps take a read through the book of Hebrews along with uh, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That would be a good collection of scriptures to help uh, settle your soul and get it even more focused coming from this Lord's, Lord's Day heading into to Tuesday night. Uh, the next place I'd have you to turn is Romans chapter 3. That might sound familiar to you as a, a culmination of the opening of the book of Romans, Paul's letter to the saints in, in Rome, uh, the opening chapters uh, declaring the entire world guilty of sin. Romans chapter 3 I'll pick up in verse 23 and read a few verses down to verse 26. For all have sinned and come short of the, the glory of God. And I, I praise the Lord that Saturday on Outreach, this was a place we were at at someone's door, being able to open up the, the scripture, a, a blessed opportunity to do that. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption, and that'll be point number two, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, uh, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. And you might say, oh, no not any sins in, in the future, and we would understand it would be your past sins and your future sins as well. Through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. And I tell you what, teaching on just the doctrine of salvation, that's a packed few, <laughs> few verses with the a lot of clear teaching and a lot of words that I'd like to uh, clarify and, and define a little bit before we get to remission, which is the focus of this, uh, this particular passage. It's what uh, brought me there, brings us there. Uh, justification, we'd like to remind us of theologically that that puts us in a courtroom scene before the just judge. Uh, again, the chapters from the beginning of this letter to the Romans, the, the early chapters building up to this point to declare everyone guilty. And you'd say, okay, yeah, everyone's guilty. Well, that, no, that means you're guilty. <laughs> so we, we understand it's, it has a universal application, um, but it needs to be specified and understood by me as an individual and you as an individual 
Now that we're standing before the judge, uh, not flippantly, as some perhaps do in our county courthouses, uh, trembling as, you know, I can't imagine what God's gavel is like and the impact of that gavel coming down guilty. And it's not going to a jury of our peers that maybe our lawyer can convince we're, that we're not guilty or to get us off. It's going right to the judge, and he declares uh, guilty. And we're sentenced to death. And the wages of sin is, is death. And we say, how can I possibly pay that fine? And, and our advocate steps forth and says, I'll pay the fine with my, my blood, by his blood. And so, and it boggles my mind every time I kind of define justification in this courtroom scene and what it, what it would be like to be declared guilty and sentenced to death and then have someone pay your fine for you, my fine, and then to reject it and say, no, here are my hands just and my, my feet. Just shackle me and take me back into bondage. I'll pay my own penalty. I, I don't understand that, and yet that was me for 21, 22 years of, of my life before I said, no, 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 I'll, I'll accept that gift, and I will walk at liberty. Uh, and you know, the way to remember it, just as if I'd never, I'd never sinned. We don't walk out innocent, and we need to specify that. The, the judge, the just judge, God, very clearly declared us guilty, and we still are guilty. But because of the payment of that, that blood, if we're willing to accept that, we're able to walk out just as if we had never sinned. It's amazing, and it's amazing, and it, it, it should boggle the minds of everyone here that's saved that someone wouldn't want that. And then maybe that'll just be an encouragement for us to be that much more passionate in describing maybe that as part of our, our personal evangelism. So that's justification. Propitiation. When was the last time you used that word when you weren't reading your Bible? <laughs> hey Amen. I just don't, uh, I don't think I said that until I, I read a Bible. Uh, how would we define that? Well, I'll give it a try. The atoning blood sacrifice that appeases the wrath of a holy God. The atoning blood sacrifice that appeases the wrath of a holy God. You know, back in, in Matthew 26, and it would have been, I believe, in Mark, as we were there this morning, uh, maybe it's uh, is troubling to you, where Jesus said, uh, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. And maybe you say, well, many? I thought it was a whosoever salvation. Well, it is, and that shouldn't trouble you as we would compare scripture with scripture in one place, we would turn and trying to fully understand propitiation would be the beloved apostles' first epistle, 1 John, the beginning of chapter 2, where he's moved to the Spirit to write, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, when that really takes us back to justification in the courtroom scene. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. And then you got to keep reading because it says, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And I remember being in a church back in Minnesota some years ago. I won't try and figure out the date. Uh, the day that the church, or at least the pastor, tried to lead the church to a reformed theology. He flipped the switch and said, today I am, I am a Calvinist and I'm going to lead the church in that direction. And we sat there dumbfounded, at least my wife and I, can't remember all the ages of the children, as he started to go through Tulip. And he got to L, the limited atonement. And I remember nudging my wife at the time and pointing to 1 John chapter 2 in verse 2, and saying, He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Some would say, well, the great Baptists, Charles Spurgeon, 
was a Calvinist. Well, maybe so, and you can read the history of that and the context of the, of the times and, and why he maybe would, uh, would have that uh, pinned to him, but if you read about Spurgeon, there is no way <laughs> that he believed in any limitation on the atoning work of the blood, the, the, the blood propitiating for the sins of the whole world. And if you think about the value of the blood, would you say it's a X value or X plus Y value or X plus Y plus Z value? Or would you say sideways eight, the infinity symbol, that's the value of the blood and the work that it can do. And how can you possibly pull that back? Herein is love in the same love letter, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's chapter four and verse 10 of that same uh, epistle, uh, first, uh, first letter of John. And not just the son incarnate, but the son crucified. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9, it, it's hard to, to study the Lord's table and not spend a lot of time in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9, uh, let me read a little bit, verse 5 to verse 7, because propitiation directs us to the mercy seat, and that's where this propitiating blood was, was sprinkled in the Old Testament on the Day of Atonement, and the Lord taking his own blood, not to some tabernacle or temple here on earth, but the temple in, in heaven. Uh, speaking of the ark and over it, the cherubims of glory sh uh, shadowing the mercy seat. Aren't you glad the mercy seat is on top of the law, which is saying guilty, guilty, guilty. You can't even come close to being uh, as holy as God would need you to be to say, come on in. So on, on top of that law is the, the seat, this covering of mercy, of which we cannot now speak particularly. And now when these things were thus ordained, the, the priests went always into the first tabernacle. That would be speaking of the outer part, uh, the showbread and, and uh, the incense and the, the candle accomplishing the service of God, verse 7, but under the, the second, so this would speak of the holiest of holies, but into the second went the high priest alone once every year. And what do we uh, call that day? The day, of, the day of atonement. And it says, not without blood. Uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of studying or meditating what the Bible says about the blood in the Old Testament and the New for you to say, I can't be saved without the blood of Jesus Christ. And we'll be it for anyone to try and take that out of my, the, the word of God that, that I'm holding in, in my hands. Uh, not without blood, which he offered for himself. That's not Jesus Christ, our high priest. That was only an earthly priest that had sins. Ours is without sin, holy, harmless, undefiled. Uh, which he, the Old Testament high priest, offered for himself and for the errors of the, the people. And this is, again, referring back to the Day of Atonement. Uh, Leviticus 16 and verse 15, then, then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before uh, the mercy seat. Well, Jesus Christ didn't go again with his shed blood uh, to an earthly temple. He, he took it to a heavenly temple and sprinkled it upon the mercy seat as the great high priest uh, before his, his father. Simply amazing. So remission, that's uh, just trying to give us a sense of propitiation after justification. And it's hard to neatly and cleanly separate all these. It's all intermingled in the blood. But remission, what is remission? Forgiveness, pardon, the blood yielding deliverance unto liberty. For my part in this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. We sang that and for, for great reason. Now, so remission, that's kind of one uh, definition, trying to put together a lot of different verses that speak of remission. Forgiveness, pardon, the, uh, the blood yielding a deliverance unto liberty. And again, that ties us to justification and really is connected to propitiation. 
But John chapter 20 and verse 23, which is a portion in John that records that uh, version, if you will, of the Great, Great Commission. As my Father has sent me, even so send I, I you. And there's a song that, that uses those words. Uh, and then in verse 23 of John 20, uh, Jesus said, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. And I like that verse because it is perhaps the, the, the clearest, straightforward definition we can give of remission or re remittance, to have our sins remitted, being the opposite of having them retained. And I'll just silently amen that in, in my heart. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. And it requires, it demands the blood. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. It requires blood. And remission of sins requires repentance, as inseparably enjoined with faith. Faith in what? In no small part in Jesus' pure and precious shed blood. John the Baptist preached repentance for remission. Again, repentance is a, a turning, and faith is a turning. Repentance toward God, faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, faith towards his, in his shed blood. So they're all connected. And so remission requires the blood and it requires repentance as John the Baptist preached. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of, of sins. And he said in John 1.29, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, this repentance uh, unto remission, is connected to that pointing to the Lamb who would shed his blood. Peter on Pentecost preached repentance for remission. This is after he had, he had preached and their hearts were pricked and they said, oh, what, do we do? what do we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. The baptism isn't for the remission of sins, although it points to what Jesus did. For the remission of sins, it's the repentance and the turning, the, the, the turning to Christ and faith in his, his blood that brings about the remission of, of sins. And you'd say, well, where is the blood there? Well, all you have to do is go back two verses when he was preaching on Christ and Christ crucified. That's where the blood is that is being pointed to. Jesus made repentance for remission part of the Great Commission, the, the gospel that we're to preach. Where is that, you say? Well, Luke chapter 24, verses 46 and 47. And said unto them, this is Jesus, of course, and said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer. And in our minds, we might think not just, oh, I stubbed my toe, but a brutal, bloody suffering that we would read about in the Gospels or prophetically back in Isaiah 53, where we were in, in part this morning, I believe, it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. This preaching of repentance points to remission, which points to the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You can't take that out of gospel preaching or sharing the gospel with someone that they would be saved. Remission through the proffered blood of the Son. Very much connected in, in the passage we read in Romans chapter 3 with redemption. So we'll move on to that point. Redemption through the precious blood of the Lamb. Ephesians 1, 7, in whom, speaking of Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. And a parallel verse would be over in Colossians, Paul writing these letters, moved to the Spirit at the same time from prison, carried by the same courier, sent to two different churches, one 
uh, started out of the evangelistic work of the other. Uh, Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption. Again, these words should be what you're staring at if you're there in your Bible. Through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Uh, redemption, being redeemed, purchased with blood out of bondage. Paul wrote to the churches in the region of Galatia. Galatians 4, verses 3 through 5. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman. He was fully man and had blood in him to shed, pure blood. Made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of, of sons purchased with blood, out of bondage, out of slavery, unto possession of the Lord. For we are bought with a price, as Paul wrote two different parts of his first letter to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 6.20, for we are, we are bought with a price. What does that mean? Well, therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And then in chapter 7 of the same letter, verse 23, you are bought with a price. Uh, be not ye the servants of, of men. Bought with a price. What is that price that purchased redemption? Well, Peter was uh, held in the Holy Spirit's hand and moved to write these words, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things. That tells me the blood of Christ that we're trying to symbolize with the pure blood of the grape was not corruptible, and that which we're symbolizing that pure blood should not be corrupted. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Again, that's uh, Peter's first letter, chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. And this purchasing of our redemption with blood out of bondage and, and into the Lord's possession, it's an eternal redemption. Circling back, and, and you can't stay away from Hebrews again, uh, thinking of this topic. Hebrews 9, verses 11 and 12, But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, and neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in, it's not my preaching style, but how many times? <laughs> Once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And at just about every verse I'm reading tonight, I find myself or every passage saying, that's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. Even if I'm not verbalizing it, my, my soul is saying, that's amazing. Praise God for his, his grace. And we were purchased with uh, blood unto reconciliation, this making of, of peace, this, this atoning work, Colossians 1.20, and having made peace you say, well, why did, did, was there peace that needed to be made? Well, because there was war going on between your wicked soul and a holy God. We were enemies and we were fighting him. And uh, having made peace through the blood of his cross. That tells me if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus Christ, the, the shed blood of the cross of Calvary, I would not be at peace with God. There would be this ongoing enmity of, of his wrath against me, his, his enemy, due to my sins. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile uh, all things unto himself, uh, Colossians 1.20. Now, lest we then forget remission of our sins and redemption through the pure blood of the Lamb, we have remembrance through the pure blood of the grape. Uh, I, I, I don't remember where this was in the Bible Institute. Maybe it was uh, church polity. Uh, 
again, I, I, I don't remember what, what class, but I remember a, a question. If you were on the mission field and you didn't have the pure blood of the, the grape available to partake of the Lord's table, would, would you just substitute something else, like take a can of Coke and use that? And I seem to recall at the time almost being able to reason myself back and forth. <laughs> uh, not anymore. <laughs> uh, if the Lord would see fit to separate me out and, and send me somewhere, um, and there was uh, partaking of, of the Lord's table, uh, I don't know the scenario, but if there was not the pure, well, let me just put it in the here and now. I don't believe we've purchased the, the elements for the Lord's table. I, mean, I could be mistaken, maybe someone has, but day off tomorrow, my wife and I were talking about that, going out and, and getting some pure blood of the grape. What if everyone in town all of a sudden decided, all the other churches, that uh, instead of going to the liquor store and buying <laughs> wine for their Lord's table, uh, they all bought up all the pure grape juice in town, the pure blood of the, the grape, and we couldn't find any. Uh, do you think... A pastor sergeant would say, that's okay, just pick up some Mountain Dew or uh, pick up some other, <laughs> no, uh, Am Amazon. Um, the pure blood of the grape, the pure blood of the grape. Uh, Lord's, Lord willing, and he is willing, that's what we'll be using. Uh, for our remembrance, remembrance through the pure blood of the grape. After the same manner also, he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Uh, not sacramentally, but as a memorial. This do in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. And... And again, this morning, it's not just a backwards-looking memorial. It's the inward look, the backward look, and the forward, exciting, hopeful look till he come. Uh, the rock of salvation testified to Israel, thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape. Uh, the contextual contrast there in Deuteronomy 32 is the bitter grapes of gall and poisoned wine. We looked at this just briefly Wednesday night. Again, it wasn't the main part of the message. Uh, for their vine, speaking of the enemies of Israel, for their vine is of the vine of Sodom. Again, this is the same portion of scripture, the same song that God wrote and had Moses write down. In the same song where God spoke of the pure blood of the grape, he contrasts it with uh, the enemies grapes and vine for their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah their grapes are grapes of gall their clusters are bitter their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps and the preacher Solomon the preacher who sought in his heart to give himself unto wine Ecclesiastes 2 and verse 3 was moved to the spirit in the book of wisdom, the book of Proverbs, to further declare the difference between the pure blood of the grape and the cup that bites and stings. In Proverbs chapter 23, let me read from verse 29 to 32. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? And I just heard uh, anecdotally just yesterday from a neighbor of uh, two people he knew in, uh, relatively recently that uh, drank themselves to death, literally, uh, just by drinking alcohol. Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. And this is the connecting part that goes back to the song in Deuteronomy 32. At the last it biteth like a serpent, 
and stingeth like an adder. Quite a contrast taking that back again to Deuteronomy 32. I want to shift uh, our thoughts a, a little bit to the pure blood of the grape and as was alluded to this morning, some of the Old Testament refers to that which comes from the grape as pointing to blood. The pure blood of the grape pointing to uh, the blood of our Savior, the, the pure, precious blood of the sinless uh, Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Uh, one interesting uh, part in the Old Testament when I was uh, trying to find some of these references to the blood of grapes was in Jacob's blessing of his son uh, Judah where he prophesied of the blood of ga uh, grapes dyeing the garments of Shiloh. And that's pointing to the Messiah, to our Savior, the Anointed One. Uh, it has a meaning of uh, peace. Think of the Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9-6. Uh, uh, peace or, or tranquil. And there's, there's a great irony there just in the history of our country in the Civil War, the, the Battle of Shiloh, again, which means uh, peace being one of the bloodiest battles up to that point in the Civil War, about, uh, I believe, 10,000 casualties on each side, over 20,000 casualties in the Battle of, of Shiloh. And that's I ironic just from the uh, historical standpoint of the United States. It's also very ironic biblically uh, related to our, our Savior that he stained his garments with his own blood for peace, but rejection of that brings the staining of his garments in warfare, in the day of vengeance, the blood of those that have rejected him. Uh, he is the Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, 6, and he's of the Lion of the tribe of, of Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be, uh, binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. And again, this is speaking of Shiloh coming. He came the first time and shed his own pure, precious blood. And he's coming again with stained garments. The faithful and true will come again, not wearing a garment washed in the blood of grapes, but with eyes as a flame of fire and crowns upon his head. Jesus will come triumphantly riding a white horse clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And this is from Revelation chapter 19. I'll read verses 11 to 13. I was somewhat paraphrasing some of that there. Let me just read it from the Word of God. And I saw heaven opened. This is John the Revelator seeing another incredible vision. He saw heaven opened early on. And now he sees, and that was to take us up. Now he sees heaven opened up again, the Lord and us coming back. Uh, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture a dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. He got accused one time for wearing this very shirt. <laughs> of being effeminate. Uh, someone, uh, a visitor that came, he, he saw myself, he saw, <laughs> Brother Fanning probably remembers that, happened to have a red shirt on the, the same day, he saw two people with red shirts on, he said, what's this with you guys in red shirts? Are you, a, are you a, a, an effeminate kind of church? And he sat down and he, he wrote a big long list of some babblings and ramblings and, and stuck it in a hymn book somewhere over there. And he left, and we've never seen him since. And I remember that afternoon, is it biblical or unbiblical for me to wear a red shirt? And I came to this passage. I said, is it good enough for my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Uh, it's good enough, <laughs> good enough for, for me. Amen. So all men, and uh, you can feel free to wear uh, a garment 
uh, dipped, in, dipped in blood, or at least red. And you say, well, is that his own blood that is symbolized? Is he coming back with his own blood shut on the cross of Calvary? And there's somewhat of a, I don't know if it's a theological debate. Uh, uh, the commentators debate this maybe back and, and forth. And anything one commentator says, guaranteed, if you search long enough, you'll find another commentator to say just the opposite. And so you throw those books away if you even have them in the first place and just bear down and read the word of God. And so some would say, oh, this, this, this is referring back to, to Calvary. And there certainly is a picture there. But the whole context is a warlike picture of him coming on a white horse to, <laughs> at the end of Daniel's 70th week. And, and uh, Israel's surrounded and two-thirds of, of the Jews have, have been killed already. And finally, the remaining third call out <laughs> for the Lord to be, sa- to be saved. And they... And he finally says, amen. That's just what I was waiting for. And he, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he gives the symbol or he says something and, and, and we muster up behind him and, and we come and we come and he's clothed with a vesture dipped in, in blood. And I believe that blood, comparing scripture with scripture, is uh, the blood that's spoken of at this uh, battle at the end of, again, Daniel's 70th week and and uh, I would uh, point to Isaiah chapter 63 to, to bear that out, comparing spiritual with spiritual and scripture with scripture. Isaiah 63 starts this way. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra, this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save, wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? So there's the picture of, of uh, blood being pictured by uh, the fruit of the vine. I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment, for the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is, is come. And I believe that does point to where we just read in Revelation chapter 19, uh, the Lord coming with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of, of God. This pure blood of the grape that was just kind of looking at the scriptures as a whole and just seeing that this picture is, is all over uh, the word of God. You know, this pure blood of the grape is a symbolic and spiritual picture of the blood of uh, Jesus Christ. We don't uh, have a little bell go ding-a-ling-a-ling or, or anything like that with Pastor Sargent saying, And somehow telling us that the pure blood of the grape has all of a sudden become uh, the pure, precious blood of the Lamb of God that, that we're to drink. Uh, and I think he made that very clear in his teaching that this morning. We do not believe the false teaching of transubstantiation. We do not believe the false teaching of consubstantiation, which is transubstantiation light, if you will, that came out of the Reformation. We believe that it's a spiritual picture, and it is memorial to help us remember the pure blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, this is in the, uh, the bread of life chapter, John chapter 6, but he spoke of his blood as well, uh, beginning in verse 53 of John 6. Then Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. If you were there, what would be your thoughts? (laughs) And you'd say, just in line with his followers at the time, which scratched their head and were saying, this is a hard thing. What is he talking about? He knew it, their hearts, whether they were whispering that one to another or just speaking to themselves. What does he? What does he mean? He said, "The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life." John six and verse sixty three, de- declaring that this was a symbolic picture. 
the pure blood of the grape is to help us remember. Remember what? Well, go and read Isaiah 53. If I didn't mention that earlier, that would be another good passage to read tomorrow or, or Tuesday before the evening. Uh, help us remember what? Well, I'm going to read John 19:34, and he had shed blood before this point as they lashed his back and stuck the crown of thorns into his head. He had already bled much, uh, but John 19:34. but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. The pure blood of the grape is to help us to remember that. Uh, Jesus' pure and precious blood sprinkled on God's mercy seat still speaks. I'll go to uh, Hebrews chapter, or Hebrews one last time, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 through 24. But ye are come unto Mount Sion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, Think justification there. And to the spirits of just men made perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Uh, Jesus' pure and precious blood sprinkled on God's mercy seat still speaks. And the pure blood of the grape still speaks, giving us remembrance till he come. What is it saying to you? It was pure blood that remitted our sins and purchased our redemption. And it's only the pure blood of the grape that is to be used for that remembrance. Every Lord's Day, we celebrate the power of the resurrection. Typically, once, only once a year, the members of Bible Baptist Church specially remember remission and redemption through the pure and precious blood of our Savior. Willingly shed by the Lamb of God, the Son of God, completely submitted and surrendered to the will of his Father, obedient unto death, even the death of of the cross. And I'll finish tonight in the same fashion as the morning message closed out with an exhortation to examine yourselves, to judge yourselves. Reading from 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27 to 31. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. And that's a judgment, as was I pointed out this morning, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. And that's speaking of physical death that had actually occurred in the, the church in Corinth. For if we would judge ourselves, uh, we should not uh, be judged. And so let that be the, uh, the imploring from God and his word, the challenge to us for uh, the next couple days before we gather at the Lord's table.